it? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Share uh, your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much. So let me, while you are sharing your screen, I would like to introduce briefly. Mr. Kinle Dorji is program leader, School of Environmental Management, Royal Thimpu College uh, uh, from Kingdom of Bhutan. Over to you, Mr. Kinle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so firstly, uh, I would like to thank the forum for giving me this particular opportunity. And uh, I would like to start directly by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Kinle Dorji, and I lecture here in uh, Royal, Uni uh, Royal Thimpu College under Royal University of Bhutan. Uh, and I also look after the School of Environmental Management that we have here in uh, Royal Thimpu College. It's an undergraduate college, university. So today I would like to speak uh, on, I would like to present actually a paper that I wrote uh, after after conducting a small research in two highland communities of Eastern Bhutan called Merak and Sakting. The topic of today's <clears throat> presentation will be actually, this is my, this is the topic of my paper. Uh, it's climate change and its perceived impacts on the provisional ecosystem services vis-a-vis -vis the community well-being of two highland communities of Merak and Sakting. And this Merak and Sakting, they are in the Eastern part of our country. To start with, I would like to introduce. Can you the, please uh, place the presentation mode? Oh, uh, is it not in the? Oh, sorry. Oh, is it in the presentation mode now? It's fine now. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, so just first to introduce. Uh, why do we need to? Uh, con why do we need to be very concerned about uh, the Himalayan ecosystem? Uh, the first thing is. Uh, the highland communities that we have in Bhutan, we have several highland communities. Bhutan is basically divided into uh, six different agroecological zones, and the uh, highest, uh, uh, the zone at the highest altitude, we call it alpine zone. And in that alpine zone, we have several communities, and we call them highland communities here. And these communities are above 2,800 meters above the sea level. And both the areas that I studied. Merak and Sakting, uh, they are, uh, they, uh, it actually situates uh, on, in the altitude above uh, 3000 meter. Uh, the first thing is about Himalayan ecology, uh, Himalayan ecosystem. So Himalayan, uh, the Himalayas otherwise referred to as the third pole or also as the water tower of Asia is continuously under uh, pressing, it's under pressure from multiple uh, different factors. And this Himalayan ecosystem that we have, it is also uh, continuously being affected by the climate change. And this climate change affects Himalayan ecosystem in two different ways. The first one, it can affect in several ways, but uh, pertinently in two different ways. The first one is it uh, compromises the regenerative capability, regenerative biocapacity of different ecosystems to produce ecosystem services. And the ecosystem services that we have or that we derive from the ecosystem can be compromised in several ways, but coming to the measurement that we would like to do and to see if the, compro if the climate change is really affecting uh, can only be done in terms of trying to study the provisioning ecosystem services. So I have uh, focused on measurement of provisioning ecosystem and how it is uh, impacted by climate change. And it's not just the climate change that is affecting the highland, uh, fragile highland ecosystems of Bhutan. It is also because the population is growing in these uh, highland communities. Uh, firstly, when I say population, it's not just the human population, uh, but also uh, the animal populations are growing because these highland, uh, highland communities that we have in our country, they are heavily dependent on the livestock. The second thing is because of the population growth, as well as because of the continuous pursuit of economic development, uh, the use of resources are very unsustainable. And these two uh, issues, particularly augment, uh, augmented by the impacts from climate change can really have adverse impact on the highland ecosystem of our country. So this particular research will look at how it impacts cli how climate change impacts the provisioning ecosystem services of the highland as well as the uh, eco uh, economy of that particular highland communities and see how can we 
uh, enhance the resilience and the adaptability of these communities in the face of changing climate. Uh, how do I how do I address the questions that I have? The first thing is I have studied the community economy. Uh, when I talk about community economy, it's about household economy. It's also about the communal economy, uh, communal uh, economy well-being of that uh, the two different uh, uh, research areas. And uh, I also try to study uh, the fragile landscape and its uh, ecosystem, provisioning ecosystem services and how it has changed as perceived by the people that I have interviewed. And finally, I've tried to integrate a study of economy and how uh, climate change is triggering the change in ecosystem affect the well-being of two communities in our country. And I have also addressed the question of why do we really need to care about the Highlanders and how are Highlanders affected by climate change and also how do Highlanders respond to the climate change. In doing so, in answering to these particular questions, I will try to uh, holistically look at how can we also enhance the resiliency as well as adaptability of these particular communities. Uh, my, the, this research particularly has one aim and four different objectives. The first one is I would like to study the impacts of climate change on provisioning ecosystem services and uh, in turn, the well-being of two different communities by firstly identifying the provisioning ecosystem services and also trying to evaluate, economically evaluate the ecosystem services uh, just to see what value the ecosystem services is worth. And thirdly, to uh, by trying to assess the agroecosystem and the livelihood of people living in uh, two communities of American something. And finally, trying to investigate people's perception of climate change and its impact so that we can also look at how can we or how can uh, uh, people in our country uh, address the issues faced by two Highland communities. Here is literature review. First thing is uh, ecosystem services. Ecosystem services, of course, is uh, something to do, has something to do with trying to frame the utilitarian as well as the beneficial ecosystem functions that we derive from ecosystem that we live. And the ecosystem services, it can either be provisioning, regulatory, uh, supporting, or cultural services can have a huge positive impact as well as negative impact if it deteriorates to the well-being of the community. So in that way, the ecosystem services that we derive from the, uh, from the natural environment that we live in actually can also be one of the prerequisite to determine the well-being of the communities. The second thing is we, of course, need to care about mountain, uh, Himalayan mountain ecosystem because Himalayan mount, mountain ecosystem is actually sanctuary to a vast collection of flora and fauna, and it has been it has been acting as the paradise sanctuary to the traditional ecological knowledge and uh, multiple cultural uh, cultural diversity. Even in the small country like Bhutan, where we have a small portion as a alpine region, we have uh, this alpine region acts as sanctuary to the vast collection of not just flora and fauna, but also several other spiritual and physical landscape elements. So the other thing is the communities in this mountain region, they are actually faced with a very unique sustainable development challenges in the face of climate change, because the Himalayan ecosystem are very fragile. They are faced with climate change and the changes happening, triggered by climate change and the changes happening in the ecosystem, they are actually undermining the well-being of people living in these regions. And human well-being, of course, uh, something to do with what are certain materials that we need to lead a decent good life. And it can encompass economic, social, cultural, and economic, uh, ecological perspective. And in that way, uh, in that way, when we try to uh, understand the merit uh, uh, interdependence between different uh, aspects of development, of course, economic ecosystem degradation can be uh, pointed uh, to as one of the major uh, factor uh, undermining the well-being of the people. And climate change, of course, like we we, we heard from many other uh, other presenters about how the global temperature is increasing and then how it is actually affecting uh, the, the communities in different ways. And then because of the climate change affecting the ecosystem in particularly in this Himalayan rain, uh, region, uh, particularly the highland communities, they are actually impacted in uh, various way, very distinct from other uh, other communities. So this particular research was uh, conducted in two small highland uh, communities of Merak and Sapting. So this Merak and Sapting, uh, since, since these areas are very small, since the communities are very small, uh, Merak has around 231 households and Sapting has around 236 households. So uh, using Cochrane's formula, I determined the 
sample size, which was 131. And then I further stratified by uh, trying to proportionately allocate households from uh, different uh, uh, districts as well as different villages. To collect data, I have used uh, four different methods. The first one is questionnaire survey, of course, containing structured as well as uh, non-structured, semi-structured uh, questions. Uh, and then I also use participatory discussion uh, uh, and uh, involving people from multiple backgrounds. Uh, and I've also used a focus group discussion. And uh, for this focus group uh, discussion, I have identified uh, five different focus groups. A group using timber, group using non-timber forest product, group using pasture land, group using water, and then the lastly, women's group. So this, uh, and then the lastly, I also use multiple economic uh, models to uh, economically evaluate the ecosystem services, particularly uh, direct method as well as contingency methods. Uh, here is the result. The first one is just to give you a brief uh, background about the economy of two different communities. Uh, first one is both the communities, they have infrastructure like ed education facilities, agriculture extension facilities, livestock extension facilities, park office, because Merak and Sakting, they both fall, uh, fall under a wild, uh, Sakting Wildlife Sanctuary. That particular areas also, uh, these particular communities, they also have park offices. And they also have a small uh, farmer's shop, and then they have uh, informal financial institution in uh, both the communities. And talking about the income, uh, both the communities, uh, they perceive that their uh, li livelihood standard has increased. And then uh, from my study, I found out it has improved by around 3.1% over a decade. And if we look at the present economic status, the mean annual household income of Merak is around uh, Nultram. Nultram is actually uh, a Bhutanese, uh, Bhutanese currency. Nultram, uh, uh, yes, 141,485, uh, which is equivalent to US dollar 2,194. And something has a similar uh, amount of uh, mean household. And then the other very uh, unfortunate thing is both Merak and Sakting, since they are highland communities, and they were also considered as one of the least developed districts under one of the uh, Zonghaks that's called Tashigang. Zonghak, I mean, it's a, a political district that we have within Bhutan. So Merak and Sakting, they are considered to be uh, one of the least developed uh, districts. And Merak has around 200, uh, not to, sorry, 22.85% and Sakting has around 19% of people living under poverty. And the poverty baseline that I've taken is uh, neutral 2,195 or US dollar 29 per month for a household. That is uh, based on the recent statistical uh, analysis done by uh, Royal Government of Bhutan. So from our standard, from Royal Government of Bhutan's standard, Merak has 22, approximately 23% of the households living under uh, uh, poverty and Sakting 19%. Now let's look at the income. So where do they get the income from? Merak 88% and Sakting 91%, the primary income source is livestock rearing. And the livestock like yak. Yak, is, yak actually makes up the majority of their livestock rearing culture. And they also have cattle, sheep, and horses. But it's also very apparent that the income diversification has happened over the last one, two decades. And 37% of the, uh, uh, the, the households interviewed also mentioned that they have other source of uh, income. And other sources of incomes included uh, selling of non-timber forest product, particularly Paris polyphyla. Paris polyphyla is actually a medicinal plant that uh, people collect illegally from, from that particular sanctuary. Uh, and uh, they sell it across the border and then they say it is uh, it can fetch a huge amount of uh, money. And then they also collect non-timber forest product like burl. Burl is actually uh, it's actually uh, collected, of, uh, it's actually some kind of disease that a tree will get and that particular lump of wood attached on the uh, trees, they cut it down and they use it to uh, make it into utensils like cups and then uh, wooden plates, which is, uh, which is very expensive in Bhutan from Bhutanese culture. So they also collect Paris polyphyla and burr and other sources are agriculture, tourism, business, they also have small contracts going on and carpentry, and then they work for wage in different uh, developmental sites. And then other thing is, uh, based on the analysis of the income, I also try to understand, I try to calculate the income disparity. And then I found, uh, I found uh, uh, that the highest amount of income earned in American something is like 550,000 mil And then like the lowest is like 13,000 mil in a year. 
that this is annual income. So in that way, I found like, I, I thought of like, why do not I try to uh, calculate the in income disparity? And then I used, uh, I, I tried to uh, use this Lorentz curve to see uh, in which area, uh, which area, uh, study site has the highest income disparity. And then I came to understand something has a higher uh, income disparity with Gini coefficients of 0 0.304 and Merak, uh, compared to Merak, which has like 0 0.236. And these are, uh, these are more than the national income disparity uh, Gini coefficients. And uh, literacy rate, and it's very surprising to see 40, only 42.9% of the people living in Merak and Sakling, they are literate. And even unfortunate, only 33% they are, uh, they have numeracy, uh, they're uh, numerically literate. So in that way, uh, in that way, when I try to study the levels of education attainment, then we have like people, there are people who have studied primary school, middle, secondary school, higher secondary school. There are also few who goes to college, who have studied college, and then some who have post-graduation as well. But one surprising thing is one fifth of the literate population, they came from monastic education, who would have studied Vajrayana Buddhism in our country. So they would have studied in Tibet, sometime in India or within our country. And about the food security, I use a global food security index, and then uh, I calculated the score uh, of two different uh, areas. And the, the scoring was done based on food affordability, availability, quality, and safety. And then Merak scored 68.6, and Sakting scored 59.5. So here, one very interesting inference is Sakting, earlier I presented Sakting, 91% uh, of people living in Sakting, they heavily depended on livestock and only 80 something percent uh, depended on livestock in Merak. So in that way, if we try to see, if we try to understand if the dependence on lively, uh, livestock can really ensure food security, I don't know, It uh, from my study, I just saw like, even if something has high dependence on life, uh, livestock, it does not necessarily ensure food security because something is more unsecure compared to Merak. And uh, the gender participation. So I also try to understand what uh, how the gender participation is there in two country, uh, two different regions. Uh, I looked at economic uh, participation, economic activities, household chores, decision making, resource control, social participation, and political representation. And then there I saw gender participation in the household activities is hugely skewed. In only only eighty nine percent of uh, eighty nine percent of households. Uh, of the households, the economic activities all dominated by male and then female, they ended up doing household chores and all. And uh, in terms of resource control and decision making, the, it's, it's, it's heavily male oriented. And even in terms of political representation, no female representatives were there in American something. It's non-existent, female representation non-existent in the local uh, governance or in any other political activities in that locality. And even in terms of literacy, male literacy was quite high. And then next, uh, that's all about the economy. Now let us look at uh, the, the uh, uh, provisioning custom services. Firstly, I uh, tried to come up with uh, the seasonal calendar and then I understood what were some things people did in this two, these two particular communities. And then I also tried to list, make a list of different ecosystem services. The first one is water, timber, fuel wood, pasture, bamboo, uh, Paris polyphyla, and then burr collection. And then based on their understanding, based on, uh, based on uh, taking uh, five different parameters of marketing demand, household benefit, availability, regenerative pop potential, and time consumed to, to harvest these particular services, I tried to priority rank. And the priority ranking was based on the priority legend of highly, pri uh, very high priority, high priority, medium priority, low priority, lower priority and lowest priority. And in something, water was highly prioritized. And although the market- Hello, Kinle. Yes, yeah, sir. You have already crossed your time. Please take a oh, couple of okay. minutes and try to wind up. Okay. Thank you. So uh, in this way, uh, water was uh, prioritized in both the areas. Uh, and then if you look at the total economic value, the total economic value of provision ecosystem uh, services derived in these two particular areas uh, is given in the table here, in the, given in the table. And then the highest, uh, uh, highest amount of value came uh, were, was for the pasture. That's because high, high number of people uh, depend on the livestock. And uh, of course, in terms of climate change, people are very aware of climate change, but they are not very aware of what is causing the climate change. Some say it's because of the electrification, some say it's because of development activity. And then uh, it is very apparent from this particular study, people perceived that the climate change is really affecting uh, them in multiple ways, either by 
bringing in erratic uh, climate variable or by causing uh, widespread animal uh, disease outbreak and all. And then overall, finally to conclude overall, uh, people, they understand what climate change is in these particular areas. And they also know that they are very vulnerable and they don't, they have very minimal adaptive capacity. 91% of the people, they have positive outlook towards climate change. That is because they mentioned the growing seasons are becoming longer. They said productivity of range land range land is being increasing. And then in that way, the livelihood impact could be positive, but on the other hand, they also said because of the, the, the lengthening growing season, the invasive pest, uh, the in, invasion by the pest of this particular pasture land, they are increasing. And then they also said that of recent uh, time, uh, the, the labor shortage has become prominent issues. And then adaptation, there are certain adaptation measures taken by government. Uh, they, uh, the government has started an insurance scheme. Government has also asked Sakin Wildlife Sanctuary to help the community people to cope up with climate change in better ways. And uh, finally, just to conclude, uh, finally, just to conclude, based on this particular study, what I found is there is the need to enhance environmental integrity by putting in different ecological measures. Uh, and there is also uh, the need to bring in eco ecosystem-based solutions so that the resource management framework is enhanced. Uh, and there is also the need to have proper financial security uh, uh, framework. There is also need to have better financial insurance of uh, the, the, the assets people have in that particular area. And of course, uh, their participation in decision-making and policy planning should be there. So just to conclude, even if 91% of the people have positive outlook towards the rising temperature, since the highlands are becoming warmer due to overarching impacts of climate change involving countless feedback loop uh, affecting overall environmental health, it cannot be sustainable. Even if 91% of people, they're happy about climate change, I feel this, is, this will not be uh, sustainable because the change that they think is, fa uh, is favorable can be very short term. Thank you. If you have any question, I'll take it. Thank you so much, Mr. Kinle, for very informative and very nicely presented topic. So our next uh, 